Bueno, ¿qué tal? Bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Eh, soy Nicolás Soma, el director del instituto, y simplemente eh, quería eh, eh, muy brevemente eh, eh, manifestar mi, mi felicidad de que estemos retomando los coloquios del Instituto de Sociología, que era una tradición que tenía el instituto eh, hasta el previo a la pandemia de manera presencial, con presentaciones de profesores y profesoras de, del instituto eh, y, de, y de afuera, eh, tanto de Chile como del extranjero. Y finalmente ahora estamos, eh, después de dos años y medio de pandemia, estamos volviendo a ese formato. Eh, y bueno, y con, con, y con esta nueva tecnología, ¿cierto? Con el aprendizaje eh, de la pandemia. Así que, bueno, estoy súper contento y espero que vengamos, lo disfrutemos y que, te, y que sea un espacio interesante de intercambio académico. Eh, y le agradezco mucho al, al equipo de extensión y comunicaciones por, eh, por eh, organizar esto y, y, y eh, el cuerpo académico del ISUB también por, por, por coordinar eh, los invitados, eh, a Andrew en, en particular hoy y a Paul. Así que eso, gracias. Bueno, como saben, hoy es, eh, la presentación va a estar en inglés, así que voy a decir unas palabras de introducción en inglés. Um, I'm really pleased to invite uh, Paul to uh, the first presentation in, in this colloquium series. Um, I know that normally we read off a list of places that uh, presenters have uh, published, um, but I just want to introduce Paul. He's an associate uh, professor in Linköping in, uh, in Sweden. And he's worked extensively on school bullying and school harassment uh, in a number of different countries in Vietnam, uh, in Sweden, in New Zealand, I believe as well. And um, I think most importantly, perhaps of all, rather than read this, this list, the reason that uh, we've invited him here today is because uh, his work really spoke to me about, uh, he, he initiated his studies, he got his doctorate in uh, uh, child studies, but uh, his work has focused very much on, on an intersection with sociology and the ways in which um, issues of, of school bullying and, and peer harassment are actually really reflections of and fi uh, uh, filtering down effects of societal norms and, and construct constructed ideas about, about power and, and relationships. So um, I'm really excited that uh, Paul can be here and give us this talk today. So Paul's going to be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up for, for questions at the end. So Paul, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take this off. Sweden, we haven't had to wear them, so I'm still getting used to it. Uh, yeah. And thanks for the nice introduction, uh, and thanks for inviting me here. Um, I keep getting asked if I've been to Chile before, and no, I haven't, I haven't been to South America before. Um, so when I received the email, I thought it was spam, and uh, I almost threw it away. Um, so I'm glad that I didn't. Uh, and it's yeah, it's a it's a pleasure to come here um, to talk at the Department of Sociology. Uh, I feel sort of at home in sociology, even though I'm not a sociologist per se. Um, I did my PhD, as Andrew said, in child studies, uh, and then I got into gender studies, so both sort of sociological areas uh, for looking at a a problem, school bullying, that is often. Uh, within the field of psychology. I'm just checking that everything's okay to... Yeah? 
as a code line. Um, and I'd like to start with this uh, issue of um, what do we really know, actually? Uh, and I've been do, do, doing research on school bullying for quite a long time. I did my master's on school bullying in New Zealand high school. And what struck me, the reason I got into it was that there was a certain way of thinking about school bullying that was very much focused on individual behavior, individual aggression, uh, particular types of children, uh, which I found quite problematic, both personally from when I went to high school. I didn't really recognize the way it was talked about. Um, but also having read within child studies and gender studies didn't completely, it made sense, but it didn't give the picture that I uh, wanted. And so I'd like to start with a, a quote from a Canadian researcher, Gerald Walton. And he's uh, written a number of theoretical articles. Uh, and then this one from 2015, he argues that instead of doing more research, we need to actually stop our industry to take a step back, look at the problem in broad contexts rather than micro moments, and go back to the drawing board. A deval of the bullying orthodoxy is called for. In short, we need to stop before we can continue to think. And this, when I uh, read this article, it really resonated with me because I, I thought we needed to actually rethink what, how do we understand school bullying. And a num number of researchers have lifted this, um, but very few in relation to the, the field of school bullying research. So that's what I'd like to do. And that's what I tend to do with my students in Lynn Shipping who take a master's course on school bullying, is just get them to think a bit and to question what we actually uh, know about school bullying. Doesn't work. I can't change the slide. Oh, now, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and as I said, school bullying research comes from uh, psychology mainly, uh, and within that, aggression research uh, mainly would be where it had its roots. Uh, and one researcher in particular, Dan Olvius, a Swede actually, but working in Norway. Uh, it's his definition that is often used when talking about school bullying. This is the definition or a variation of it that would be used quite a lot. So a student is being bullied or victimized when he or she is exposed repeatedly and over time to negative actions on the part of one or more other students. This is quite a straightforward definition. I have no great problem with this definition. Um, but it's more how it's been understood, interpreted, researched, and so on. And within this, uh, Dan Olvius uh, in 93, in the same text as the definition, he also stressed that the term bullying is not or should not be used when two students of approximately the same strength, physical or psychological strength, are fighting or quarreling. In order to use the term bullying, there should be an imbalance in strength and asymmetric power relationship. The student who is exposed to the negative actions has difficulty defending him or herself and is somewhat helpless against the student or students who harass. And if you've heard anything about school bullying, you probably recognize this sort of uh, discussion. And what I've highlighted here is this connection between an asymmetric power relationship and an imbalance in strength. And it's sort of here that I have a, uh, an issue with the uh, way in which we understand school bullying. Because Dan Olvius did his initial research on boys. Girls were not seen to be aggressive. Uh, I'm married, so I know that they can be. Uh, but at the time, this was the idea. So the focus was on boys, their aggressive behavior. It was direct forms of bullying, their physical bullying. So it made sort of sense that these bullies, you've seen films and series with the stereotypical bully, the big guy who beats up the small guy. And this, this sort of discussion is, is very common within school bullying research. Uh, these researchers from New Zealand, 
um, they also make this, this point that there are other types of behavior that are sometimes mistaken for bullying, but which occur in the open and do not involve an imbalance of power. For example, two individuals may get into an argument or a fight, uh, verbal or physical, as tempers flare up and things get out of hand. Or such conflicts need to be dealt with in schools in a transparent and fair way. They do not constitute bullying. So this focus on this imbalance of power. I think this is highly problematic because someone may retaliate who is being subjected to bullying, and then it may not be recognized as bullying because it can be seen as this is a back and forth between students without knowing the, the context of what is going on. Everyone understanding me so far? Yes? Yeah. Uh, and within, within school bullying research, there tends to be these three criteria that we talk about when defining what is bullying. Uh, and people use them in sort of different ways, but Peter Smith, he's a professor emeritus in England at Goldsmiths University. He talks about the hardcore assumptions of the bullying research program. So that we have these assumptions about what is bullying. And these are that there's an intention to cause harm or discomfort that it's intended to hurt somebody. The second is that it is repeated. So it's not just once. I don't just hit you once or say something mean once, it's repeated. And that there is this imbalance of power. And it's here that I want to focus this on the imbalance of power. I talked a bit more about repetition yesterday in a, a, a different talk. And this, this discussion of a power imbalance has been it's widely accepted. I think all bullying researchers probably accept that there should be this imbalance of power, but there's big differences in how we think about what is a power imbalance. Uh, and there has been very little discussion of what is meant by that. Uh, as Valen Court and co-authors have stated, Despite the fact that current definitions of bullying emphasize the power differential that exists within bully victim relationships as a key characteristic of bullying, there has been little, if any, systematic investigation of the links between bullying and power. So it's sort of, we know what this bullying imbalance is. It has to be there, but how do we understand this? Uh, and as they point out, there's been little appreciation of the fact that social power reflects an interaction between the characteristics of the individual and the social context in which he or she operates. So not just that someone is bigger or stronger, but also the social context, social power. Um, so here they're pointing to something and they discuss two kinds of social power, explicit social power and implicit social power. Um, and I guess it's here that there's been a lot more research now within um, social psychology uh, on relations between individuals or groups of individuals. Um, Volk and others, they've also pointed out uh, that power is not solely a property of relatively stable individual factors, such as a person's size and strength, what Olvius was pointing towards, but also of situational, social, or environmental variables that result in a dynamic ecology that can change the power dynamic. Yeah. So they're pointing to a much more complicated understanding of what power is, who has power, when is there a power imbalance? And this focus on a dynamic ecology, this is something which myself and uh, colleagues have been looking more at in terms of a social ecological perspective. So drawing on the work of Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Does anyone know Yuri Bronfenbrenner? I'm going to explain it anyway. Yeah. Um, essentially, it looks like this if you take Bronfenbrenner's uh, work. And he was critical of this focus on just the individual or interactions between individuals and wanted to broaden out this discussion. So essentially in the middle, we have the individual. So the pupil, the 
is bullied, for example. But around that, we have other contexts within there, within which they're situated. So the microsystem, researchers often discuss this in terms of the direct relations that in, the individual has with other individuals. So these direct relations. So if I, if I was to be hit by you, that would be this microsystem. That's the interactions between us. I'm not suggesting you will hit me, but it's, it's, it would be in here. And then if you take a step further out, he also pointed to what he called the MISO system. And here we have, so an individual may have relations, for example, a group of friends. So that would be MISO, uh, microsystem. They may also have uh, relationships with their siblings. That would be another microsystem. And here it's the relations between those microsystems. So for example, between siblings and classmates or between um, parents and teachers. Yeah? The individual has a relationship with both and it's when they interact. That would be the MISO system. It gets a bit complicated around MISO and EXO, but the EXO system is a step further away from the MISO system. So essentially it's relations between different microsystems, but where the individual is not connected to one of them. So it could be the school board, for example, and the teacher. The individual has the relationship to the teacher, but not to the other people. But that can affect what happens to the individual. If we take one step further out, we come to what he termed the macro system, which is quite vaguely described uh, as a blueprint. Um, but essentially here we have the societal, uh, the macro uh, level. So norms about gender, about race, about age and so on. We have uh, traditions that in Sweden, you have to drink at least three cups of coffee a day. That will affect you if you don't do that. People will talk about you. Um, here you could have, uh, for example, Donald Trump when he talks about building a wall. So the, he's drawing on these discourses of race and uh, immigration. And they filter down and impact all of these. So it's a much broader view of thinking about school bullying. Uh, and this is what we have been using recently in our uh, research. I hope this makes sense. I'm going to come back to it anyway. Okay, so I'm going to go through all of them with sort of examples related to power. Uh, a close colleague to me, uh, who's also at the same department, Robert uh, Thornberg, or Thornberg, um, he wrote an essay on this social ecological model and argued that this could be a meeting place for researchers from different disciplines. Because there's quite a lot of tensions between those who perhaps take a more sociological approach to school bullying and those who take maybe a more developmental psychological approach to school bullying. And he argued that um, although the social ecological framework is provisional, partial and fallible in line with all other theories, it embraces both the first, so this is where there's a focus on individuals, and the second order perspectives. This is more on social relations. And is therefore suggested here as a possible meeting space for a dialogue between them as well as within. So what we've been using is this because researchers within bullying have been using this, but have tended to focus here. So we want to take Bronfen Brenner and actually look at these other levels, these other systems. So if we start at the individual level, so that's the right in the center there. Um, Ken Rigby, this is just an example. There have been lots of discussions about power differences that are commonplace in schools. Um, and he states that this is a, a list of the kinds of power differences that are commonplace. Um, so one being able to physically hurt others. So this is the strength and size yeah, that you can punch someone and make them cry, for example. Being numerically superior so that you're a group against one person. So there's one victim and there's a group of bullies. Being more confident, more assertive than others. Having greater verbal dexterity, so being able to 
joke and reply quicker, um, be good with making up names and so on. Having superior social or manipulative school skill. So these social skills that some students tend to be better at, right? Than maybe the person who's been bullied and has lost confidence. But at the end of this, he also states having greater status and the corresponding capacity to impose on some others. And here he's pointing away from the individual, I would argue, uh, to more this social relations and status, hierarchy is, and so on. So it's a question of whether he's focusing on the individual, because you could also take the question, well, being able to physically hurt others, does that give power in all situations? Probably not at university, um, maybe in an in a elementary school, school uh, at an all boys school, for example. Um, and why does someone have greater verbal dexterity, for example? Why is someone more confident? Carol Walton has also pointed to the fact that children and youth bully each other predominantly because of social difference on any number of grounds, including race, gender expression, real or perceived sexuality, class, physical attractiveness, bodily size and shape, social competence, and so on. And a lot of the time, I think, when we talk about this, that someone was bullied because they were um, ugly, yeah, or because they've got glasses, or because they've got red hair. We, we've sort of discussed this in terms of individual attributes. So the individual, why is this person bullied? Because they've got red hair, because they're fat, or because they have glasses. But what he's pointing to actually is this macro system, which I'm going to come back to, yeah, to norms and how we understand what is normal, what is ugly, what is beautiful, and so on. So I've put a question mark on whether that's the individual. Um, if we move a step further out from the individual and look at the micro system, and I, I would say that's where we are really now. I would say that's the more common area to look at now within school bullying research, more social psychological perspectives. We can look at, for example, social identity theory, that we get our identity from the groups that we belong to. Uh, in groups, those that we belong to, and out groups, those that we don't belong to. We can look at group norms. So different groups have very different norms, even within the same school, within the same classroom. So some groups might have more what could be considered anti-bullying norms. Uh, for example, those kids that see themselves as the nice ones. Yeah, they're friendly. They're helpful. They're may be part of the, the bullying team at school. Yeah, they go and help someone if they're hurt and so on. But there can also be those groups that have perhaps more pro-bullying norms, those that are the tough kids, um, the cool ones, that we don't take any shit from anyone. Sort of. uh, and then it may not be as problematic in that group to bully someone. And there's, there can be quite a lot of peer pressure and... Uh, demands on conformity if you want to stay part of the group. So if you're part of this group and you start to bully someone, that may negatively affect your position in the group, right? So if the group sees themselves as nice ones and so on, it would be deviant behaviour within that group. Whereas in this one, if you didn't join in, you may receive peer pressure to at least be involved to the extent that you laugh or you close the door so that the person can't leave and so on. Uh, Ronald Jacobson, uh, an American researcher, he's also written about bullying as a form of self-narration. So as a means of doing identity, so that it's through the actual bullying that the identity is done. For example, to be part of this group as a way of showing that you belong, that you are tough, that you are cool, that you are willing to be part of it. In a similar way, Judith Butler within gender research has talked about doing gender so that you don't have your gender, but it's done repeatedly. So I only look fantastically masculine because of the way I dress. It's not just something I have. I put effort into it. 
Um, so this could also be, when talking about bullying, uh, a way of doing masculinity, for example. If you have these masculine norms that boys don't cry, boys are tough, that's a way of showing that you are a proper boy, perhaps. I also talk about it in terms of presentation of self um, along similar lines as a way of doing the self. Yeah. So using Goffman here. And also a way of managing the impressions that you give off to others. Yeah. Um, and he's talked about that as a means of con conducting the conduct of others. I'm using a Foucauldian expression here, but essentially to control how the other person behaves towards you by right? managing the impression that you give off. So if you were to cry and you're part of the tough group, yeah, you've sort of dropped the mask a bit, haven't you? And then this microsystem, so we're still in this where the direct relations are. Can also talk about social hierarchies and status, and this is something which uh, my recent PhD students done a lot on on this in terms of uh, status in in groups and how that affects behaviour. So how um, someone is involved in bullying behaviour, even if they perhaps think that it's wrong, but they may still do it. And then the question becomes, what is it that gives status? I don't know how it is in Santiago, but when I grew up in New Zealand. Rugby gave a lot of status for a boy playing rugby. Football, not so much. That was considered a, a girl's sport when I grew up in England. But in England, or at least in parts of England or in Sweden, football would give status to a boy. If you're, if you're good at football, you're going to have high status. Um, not so much in my old high school. So that's contextual. Um, and research has consistently shown that bullies often have higher status. So they're often popular. That doesn't mean to say they're liked, but they may be seen as cool, tough, and so on. And you can sort of guess where I'm going to go next. Uh, victims often have lower status, which is not surprising. Uh, they're lower down on the social hierarchy. And the question is whether they're there because they've been bullied or whether they're bullied because they're down there. Bit of a chicken or egg question, which I won't try and answer. Uh, and defenders. So these are, we've also talked about bullying in terms of different roles that people take on. So bystanders, for example. So those that aren't directly involved, but maybe see what's happening, so on. And those who help the victim in a bullying situation have often been referred to as defenders uh, in, the, in the US upstanders, but often defenders. And these often have higher status as well, which is quite revealing. Why do they have higher status? Because there would be a great deal of risk if you have lower status and try to defend someone against those who have high status, right? So trying to encourage pupils to take on this defender role needs to be a bit nuanced because there's, there's a high risk game. If you don't have high status, there's quite a risk involved. So it tends to be those who have high status and feel that they can do it and still not end up lower down. Yeah. Um, in my PhD research, I used Foucault quite a bit. Uh, it was a while ago now, but I, I've used him in terms of how he thinks about power. Uh, and as he, he wrote, power is not something that is acquired, seized, or shared, something that one holds onto or allows to slip away. Power is exercised from innumerable points in the interplay of non-egalitarian and mobile relations. It's a difficult quote in English, alone in a second language, but uh, essentially he's saying you don't have power you exercise it, right? And in different situations, you'll have more access to power than other situations. And this is really important, I think, for thinking about school bullying, because it suggests that you can lose that ability to exercise power as well. If you do something that reduces your status, for example, here you cried in a football game, for example, that could affect your status. 
and you may not have as much access to power anymore. The Danish professor, Dr. Marie Sundegård, she's coined a, a really nice term, uh, social exclusion anxiety. And what she means is that we all have this need to belong, this existential need to be part of a group, to have friends and so on. And that because of that, there's always this social exclusion anxiety. There's always this fear that is just under the surface, right? That something could happen and we may lose our belonging in a group, for example. I, uh, she talks about it as a, a fear that smolders beneath the surface when we interact. Yeah? So it's always there. You're always you're worried about that they, they won't like you. They will. Um, think you look strange because of what you're wearing that day and so on. The nightmare about going to school naked. Um, yeah, that would be part of this anxiety. Um, and uh, my previous doctoral student, myself and Robert uh, Thornberg, wrote an article sort of along these lines in terms of the fear of being singled out. So why don't students who think that bullying is wrong, why do they still get involved? Yeah. So why do they still laugh when it occurs? Why do they maybe hold the person? Why do they call them a name? And it related it to this, this fear of being singled out, that it could be you next. You could be excluded. You could be bullied. He's checking how I'm doing for time. I'm doing okay, I think. Um, yeah. And thinking about this microsystem, the, these two, Dorothy Espelage and Johnson Hong, they've written a lot from the social ecological perspective. Um, and this is how they define this microsystem. We're still at this microsystem level. Right? They write that the most direct influences and in bullying behavior among youth are within the microsystem, which is composed of individuals or groups of individuals within immediate settings. So a school, for example, um, e.g. home school with whom youth have interactions. So there are these direct relations. Make sense? Yeah. If I then take Bronfenbrenner's explanation, we get a slightly different picture. He writes, a microsystem is the complex of relations between the developing person and environment in an immediate setting containing that person, e.g. home, school, workplace, etc. There's a bit of a difference here in that here we've got individuals or groups of individuals, yeah? these interactions. What he argued was it's not just between individuals or groups of individuals, it's also in relation to that environment, not just the social environment, but also the physical environment, so the institutional context. Uh, and this is something which I've focused quite a bit on recently is how the school plays a role in this, in thinking about power and how it affects behaviour. Uh, Swedish professor Emeritus, he is now uh, at or a Brewer University, it's not that far from Linshipping. He's uh, Him and his colleagues wrote about the school as an arena for bullying. And so they're looking at how the school impacts what goes on. Uh, and they did it in a similar way to an English researcher, Neil Duncan. And what he did uh, 10 years later, 11 years later, was point to different elements of schooling that impact relations between students or how they experience school. The first one is compulsion. You have to be there up until a certain age anyway. Uh, even later, if you have expectations to go to university and so on. So you can't leave. So what does that do? If you're being bullied or if you're frustrated and you just want to break, you cannot leave the school setting without getting a fine, without your parents getting in trouble. And essentially, you're, you're, re, you're placed back into that environment all the time, right? You can't just leave the classroom. The other one is compression. 
uh, that you must learn to live in a crowd. Anyone who's been in a school, I'm, I'm guessing it's the same here. There are a lot of kids in the same space, right? Whether it's in the classroom, whether it's on the playground, whether it's in the cafeteria, there's a lot of people. And this means that when things get a bit much, you get a bit emotional, you can't really take a step back. You're always on show. Yeah? So if we think about impression management, you're always on front stage. There's nowhere where you, unless you go to the toilet, maybe. Uh, the third one is control. Um, that daily life in schools is very controlled. Right? In Sweden, you have to raise your hand if you want to go to the toilet. You can't drink in class. You can't eat in class. Um, in a lot of countries, in a lot of schools, you're told how you should have your hair. You can't have jewellery. You, you have to sit still. Yeah. You get a 15-minute break. And, so. and researchers have suggested that a lack of this may lead to a desire to re regain a degree of control in another way. So how this may lead to, for example, bullying, a way of gaining control. Um, in my research in Vietnam, it included getting certain kids to go to the school cafeteria during the break, because you only have 15 minutes, and there was a queue like at Starbucks here. So all your break was taken up just trying to get a drink. So you'd send someone else yeah, with the threat of them getting bullied if they didn't do it. Uh, and competition, and not only scholastic, but also social, that you're always competing yeah, in these social hierarchies, but also in terms of grades, so you know who are the smart kids, who are the dumb kids. Pritol's always argued that where there's power, there's resistance. He would argue that the two sides are the same coin, so it's the same thing, it just depends which position you're in. Um, and I, I won't go through these in depth, but there are a lot of authors who have talked about resistance in schools. Yeah? Uh, Goffman, in his asylums, um, he wasn't talking about school per se, but how you get around these rules, these regulations, um, to get around how controlled you are. McLaren in schools has talked about rituals of resistance. So, for example, you have to sit still at your desk. So what do you do? You break the end of your pencil, and you go and sharpen it, right? That's a way of legitimately being able to leave your desk. Or you, you walk slowly to class. Or... Uh, James C. Scott's written about hidden transcripts. So for example, note passing in classes where you're not allowed to talk, but people send notes. Now I guess it's SMS. Uh, so around the back of authority. Yeah. Ira Shaw's talked about Siberian syndrome. So why those kids who don't relate to schooling, to the, to the teacher, if they can choose freely, they would tend to sit at the back, yeah, as far from the teacher as possible in Siberia, yeah, as far away as possible. Uh, and Cornell and uh, many others within um, school masculinity's research have talked about how those who are targeted uh, are often those who associate themselves with schooling and scholasticism. So the nerds, the geeks, the swats, the teachers' pets, the wimps, and so on. There's a whole list of these terms for those who sit at the front, not in Siberia, and who study too hard. Uh, yeah. So I'll stop there. This is the micro system. And even just here, uh, this is. There's a lot going on in this microsystem, right? Away from the individual, what that the individual has to navigate. If we take a step further out to the meso system, uh, and this was relations between microsystems. And this would be going into different settings, for example. So the football club where you play football, or the school, or the playground where you meet your, your friends who maybe don't go to the same school. And how this can affect these presentations of self and impression management in different ways. For example, if you get, you score an own goal while playing football for your club, and then people talk about it, it gets back to school, and that affects your status in school and so on. Um, and it can be really difficult to balance these different norms and expectations and so on. It can be difficult as a researcher, trying to balance teachers' expectations and students' expectations. 
but how you do that without affecting your position in the other city. Uh, this is the title for uh, uh, an article. Uh, I didn't just write uh, obscenity on the on the board. Uh, Wayne Martino in Australia wrote an article called A Bunch of Arseholes. And essentially what he's showing is a boy who starts to get bullied because he's carrying a briefcase of things or an art uh, portfolio uh, to the bus. And people start calling him gay or fag uh, because he's carrying this art folder. And then it, other people hear it, right, at the bus stop. It gets back to school and this child's status just goes through the floor. Um, so this shows this mesosis and how what, something that happens somewhere else can play in into the other, other system. The exosystem is almost, there's very little on this uh, research-wise. We tended to focus on the microsystem. But if we just focus on the school, this is a step further away where this, the individual is not uh, part of these discussions. Yeah? So you can think of anti-bullying plans that are, are drawn up without input from the individual. Anti-bullying work, yesterday I talked about how um, the terms become blurred and teachers have to make judgment calls on what they um, act on. And that can affect the power relations in the microsystem. School rules, playground monitor systems, classroom rules, seating arrangements is something which a lot of students take up and are unhappy about, uh, streaming, grading, these sorts of things which students don't often have any participation in, but can affect their direct relation. So this is further out to the exit. I, I think there's almost nothing on this uh, level within bullying research anyway. And then if we go right out to the, to the last uh, system, uh, we get to this macro system. And Foucault pointed to the importance of um, power as something, as something that circulates, right? That you don't hold it, you have access to it, you're able to exercise it in some situations. And he argued that power must be analyzed as something which circulates, or rather as something which only functions in the form of a chain. It is never localized here or there, never in anybody's hands, never appropriated as a commodity or piece of wealth. Power is employed and exercised through a net-like organization. And what he's meaning here, if you think of a net, it's like in crosses, right? And depending where you are, you can have access to, I could have access to being white, for example, to being a man, to being over, let's say over 30, and so on. Uh, so you have access to different forms of power. Um, and what he argued was that every relationship of power puts into operation differentiations, which are at the same time its conditions and its results. Yeah. So if I bully someone because I'm heterosexual and I bully them for being gay, I do it because I'm able to within this context, this perhaps homophobic context. But at the same time, I'm reinforcing it, yeah, these discourses. So it's both the condition and the result. Uh, and a number of researchers have pointed to this, that a lot of these acts of bullying uh, um, are reiterations of these, these norms at the macro system level, yeah? that they're not disconnected from this. So to look at individual behavior without looking at the macro system doesn't really make that much sense. Um, Jessica Ringrose and Emma Reynolds in 2K have talked about normative cruelty. So a lot of those cruel things that are done in schools are often quite normative yeah, and sort of expected. So why boys behave the way they do in schools? Perhaps because masculine norms suggest that that's the right way of being a boy. Um, I've got a little bit more time. Quite much, yeah, okay. Um, and going back to Goffman, you can talk about stigma processes. And I'm at the Department of Sociology, so I'm not going to go deep into Goffman. I'm sure you know who he is. Um, but you can look at it in six sort of steps in terms of bullying. Yeah? 
that someone's identified as being different or weird or odd or other, that they're labeled through the use of these stigma terms, geek, nerd, uh, fag, and so on. And that leads to that they become a bit isolated, right? Because there's a risk of hanging out with them. They've got a stamp on their head. So there's this risk of social contagion. It's hard for them to have friends because they're, you know, there's a risk of those people also being targeted by association. And they're targeted, and this can happen repeatedly, and it's bullying, it's, it's repetitive behavior. So these people, these students become positioned as other in some sense. They're abjected, they're dehumanized, they're not like us. Yeah? They're the ones that we, we target with our uh, verbal comments and so on. Another way which I think has been helpful to think about this, I've drawn on the work of Giorgio Agamben, um, and he's talked about two overlapping life spheres, and here he's drawing on the Greek um, terms. So one Zoe, which is a simple natural life that you eat, you, you, know, you sleep and so on. But also bios, so the social political life that he, he referred to, that you can vote, that you can be part of a group and so on. And he argued that certain individuals become persona non grata. They become what he called homo sasa. I've heard this uh, pronounced in a lot of different ways. I'll just say homo sasa. Um, and he looked at bandits, for example, or outlaws that, you know, they're, they're not part of this uh, bios. I mean, they're no longer provided the pr protection of law under the sovereign, yeah, because they're, they're not like us. They don't have the same rights. They're not within this bios. So they're excluded from the rights of bias and reduced to what he termed their life. Yeah, and people have used it to talk about refugees and, and so on. And they're forced to live in what he called a state of exception, so a life without peace. And I think this state of exception is a useful way of thinking of when power goes overboard and becomes a um, state of domination. So in terms of bullying, it could be understood in relation to stigma processes, so this dehumanizing process, uh, dehumanization and domination. So the bullied other, so this person that is, you know, uh, stigmatized and dehumanized is cast out from the social group. They're still part of the class, probably, because that's what school they have to be there. Um, but they're no longer for, afforded the rights of equals. They're not seen to be equal to the rest of us. So they're essentially positioned in a state of exception where an anti-bullying norms are no longer deemed to apply. Yeah? It's okay to bully them. It's deserved. They've brought it on themselves. You hear these sorts of explanations. They're weird. So even though kids might think that bullying is wrong, which they often say that it is, they may still engage in it for those that are in this state of exceptions, the, the other. Uh, and Foucault and James C. Scott talked about relation of domination as where this abuse of power, so where the possibility for resistance is still there, but it's severely curtailed. And it might find outlet in subtle forms, for example, farting behind the teacher's back or something like that. Uh, or extreme forms, suicide, self-harm, school shootings, which have been in the news again. You know, that it may build up and build up because there isn't this outlet for resistance. Um, I'm almost finished. Uh, yeah. So going through this, I've tried to elaborate on how we can think about bullying more in terms of taking seriously this idea of an imbalanced power, what does it actually mean? And I think this social ecological perspective opens up for a lot of discussion. Um, Gerald Walton, uh, this researcher in Canada, used this uh, metaphor, spinning our wheels. Uh, and he said, I'm suggesting that the problem, wheel spinning, that has resulted despite a wealth of anti-bullying efforts, lies in our very ideas about what bullying is. These ideas are what I refer to as discourse on bullying. 
So that means that we're putting in a lot of energy, a lot of research. We're, we're coming up with these anti-bullying plans, but we're doing this. We're not getting any. And he's arguing that's because we're thinking about it in the wrong way. It's quite a bold statement. It's a, a critical argument. But I, I sort of see where he's getting at here, yeah? that we're putting in all this energy, but we're not really. In Sweden, bullying rates are increasing. And we have so much focus on bullying and other forms of um, degrading treatment. Melantine uh, has talked about it in this way. She says the irony, of course, is that bullying behaviors are as nebulous as smoke. And we're trying to catch them with a butterfly net. And I think that's what I've shown today, I hope, that it's not that simple. It's not just individuals and their aggressive behavior. There's a lot more going on. Um, so it's really hard to catch these butterflies when they're made of smoke. They're going through the net. And I, I replied to Robert Thornberg's uh, essay about this social ecological model as a uh, meeting point for researchers. And what I wrote then was perhaps most surprisingly, the last doll to this macro system, because you can think about it like a Russian nesting doll, you know, where you've got the little dolls and you pull them apart. So we're focused a lot on this little one in the middle, right? But we haven't really focused on the big one. When you put it all together, that's the one that all the others stem from. But we've tended to focus here rather than looking at, well, what is it part of? Thank you very much for listening to me. I didn't talk too quickly. I know you speak quickly in Spanish here, but questions? Well, thanks all very much for your talk today. I know nothing about this subject, so for me it was all learning and uh, so uh, I have uh, two questions. Um, first, uh, you refer to those concepts of power, which emphasize the circulation, and that power is never a focused as a type. But I guess uh, that uh, if you uh, get into a uh, platform. You can probably predict very well first time who is the 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 bully and who is in bully and who is in the gender. Yeah. So probably in, uh, there may be some agreed way of questioning the stability of these uh, power positions. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, I wonder if there's some some agreed research question how much really power circulates uh, or, or uh, uh, following Foucault's uh, mm -hmm. uh, way. Yeah. Or rather, it's something that is uh, stable and that it doesn't change too much. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of it would seem quite stable in a school, uh, but I would argue that that is based on the norms within the school. So, for example, when I went to high school in New Zealand, it was a rugby school. Yeah. So it was very clear. Those bigger boys who are rugby players, they could exercise the most power for sure. But in another school, perhaps, where there's a completely different focus on um, scholasticism and so on, there's a question of they would still have that degree of power because of the, the norms at the macro level in terms of what masculinity is and how we look at uh, that. But it would be more nuanced than that in terms of you would also have those smarter kids who perhaps could exercise more power, which they probably wouldn't do necessarily in the the rugby blames to the same degree. So there is, I think there is the stability as well, but I think what he's pointing to is that it shifts. So uh, I've been at gender and education conference in um, Sydney not that long ago. And there, yeah, I, I wouldn't be as openly verbal and expressing my views as one of the few men in the room. Then it becomes a different situation, right? But if I was at the pub, uh, watching football, there's a completely different sort of discourse. There's a different um, position that I would have within that space. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, sure. so, I wouldn't argue that it's not completely stable either, but well, I would argue that it's not completely stable, but there is this stability because of how we think about um, masculinity, for example, ethnicity, and so on. But I think within racial bullying research, you can see uh, researchers have looked at the, um, so the makeup of the classrooms, for example, so how many are from uh, this ethnicity or how many are white or whatever, and that that changes the dynamics in the classroom as to who who is being bullied for. Yeah, sure. I'm not going to defend Foucault wholeheartedly. I've just used his ideas. Yeah. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, I wonder. I mean, the concept of bullying basically is very complex, yeah. right? So I was wondering how basically in your research or empirical research world basically made a distinction between different types of work. Yeah. Because I was wondering, okay, it's different if you are, I mean, if you are bullied because you are small you're, or you're fat, yeah. completely different than if you belong to a certain kind of group, mm -hmm. depends on your ethnicity, yeah. your racial status, and so on, so on, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how in this model that you presented today, you can basically talk to mm -hmm. different kind of different definitions of types bullying yeah. and uh, at different ages, because I guess that, for instance, if you're in an elementary school, it's completely different yeah. to secondary school or when you're an adolescent. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you basically relate to that style. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Differentiation. Yeah, big, big question, really. Um, I think in terms, if I take this uh, second part in terms of you know, different grade levels and so on, I mean, for me, that really highlights the point that Bronfenbrenner is actually making that. It's not just about individuals and groups of individuals. There's a lot more in terms of how the school is set up, in terms of which age groups, uh, what the focus is. Do you, do you shift between classes at a certain age? Is there a particular age at which you switch from one school to another? Um, so that, for me, would point towards that. And I, I think in terms of the other part, um, you could also look in terms of different kinds of schools. So... And there's almost nothing on that within school bullying research. So how does it look at a Montessori school? How does it look at a Waldorf school? How does it look at an international school? Because a lot of the research that has been done has been quantitative questionnaires that have been sent out to lots of schools, and we get the information back. But we know very little about the school context within which it, it occurred. Um, and I think the same thing in terms of... Um, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, sexuality, and so on, is that we haven't looked at, yeah, people have in terms of racial bullying, for example, LGBT homophobic bullying, but generally in the school bullying research, we haven't looked at this context. So what do these classrooms look like? What do these schools look like? How are they made up? How many um, immigrant uh, in the school, how many, you know, what's the class status and so on. We know quite little about this sort of uh, framework that they're um, interacting with. Did I answer your question? Well, sort of. I mean, I was wondering, for instance, that basically the, the concept of your presentation is the power environment, right? Mm. So I was wondering, okay, in the context of, let's say, uh, multi multicultural. Yeah. Yep. So you you start thinking about okay, if you are a minority, mm -hmm. you know, of course there are going to be some tensions between the the majority group and the minority. Group. Yeah. But uh, but I think that it changed a lot if you are you know in a very highly segregated area. Yeah. And uh, so I was wondering how the you know different kind of bullying. And, and different stages in school, you know, that how the picture basically mm. uh, portrayed in those different contexts. So the links between those, yeah, that's really hard to uh, comment on, really, because we haven't done that research. Like making 
than or within certain parts of school bullying research. But I can think in terms of uh, yesterday I mentioned Donald Trump, for example, um, this discourse about building the wall and so on. And uh, Southern Poverty Law Center looked at what effect that had in schools in the US on the discourse that was used on the um, feelings of Mexican students, for example, the fear of being targeted and so on. So, and for me, that's not just a, um, uh, it is an anti-immigrant discourse, but it's, it's a very specific one that's being lifted up. And it's those students who are being targeted rather than perhaps those from, I don't know, Senegal or wherever, because it's being pumped out in the media, for example, from this macro system level through the, the exosystem where the media would also uh, focus. And you making those connections is, um, there are researchers that have used this uh, social ecological model and have pretty much said that they're focused on the micro system level, a little bit in the meso system, uh, so parent teachers, um, so the role of parents, but beyond that, they haven't looked because empirically, it's really hard to make these, these links. Um, but I think it depends on what kind of research you're doing. Um, I, I would say you could make these links in terms of discourse, for example, discourse analysis and so on, to look at what is being used. It's a, it's a hard question. I don't know if I, the answer. I, don't know if I have the answer. Anyone else? I ask you one quick question before we finish. Um, kind of frame it in sociological terms because of the context we're in, but it, it could apply also to, to the social psychology literature. I think there's, um, isn't there a tendency in the micro system in all of this identity management, whether it be Goffman, whether we're using Foucault, whatever? Yeah to sort of assume a certain level of, of it operating, even if unconsciously at a rational level. Yeah. And may, maybe because psychology has dominated in mm -hmm. this field a lot. What about the sociology of emotions, yeah. which is an understudied field anyway, or undervalued field in sociology probably. Yeah. And, um, and do you know much about what, literature or what research has been done from a, from a more socio-emotional, I mean, you mentioned Sondergaard. Yeah. So that's why I kind of bring in this question because social, uh, that's the literature on, on social anxiety. Mm. You know, that a lot of this stems from, yeah. I don't want to be a victim, therefore I become something else. Yeah. But, but not in a rational way, just in a, in a pure gut kind of Wait, is, is there much on this and how do you see that literature? Um, no, I, within the school bullying research, I don't think there's much at all. Um, so that's your next, uh, <laughs> next such project. Um, I, I, I agree uh, that we haven't looked so much at this like emotions and because that, that plays a massive part, yeah, that you get angry, you get upset. Um, and in a paper that we're, Myself and a colleague are writing at the moment, we're looking at the football pitch. So what it's made of. So it's made of concrete or gravel or whatever. So we're looking at the school environment and how that affects these interactions. And one of the things that's coming up there is that it makes a huge difference. If you're playing football and someone goes like that and you fall and you fall on concrete, it's a big difference to falling on grass. Yeah. Where you don't cut up your knee. You don't hurt yourself you don't end up crying you don't get as angry uh, and what we're finding is that that plays a massive part so i think there's a lot of scope there for looking more at emotions because you know these the micro system that's emotionally charged anyone who goes into a school playground see how emotionally charged and kids that just completely lose it you know when something has happened so to then just look at you know, this, um, that it's uh, thought through in this sense, uh, I think it's probably. I mean, uh, you could connect that to the meso system. Yeah. Because 
in Chile, we've got this situation with the number of migrants coming into the country. Yep. Now that's connected to meso level discourses about nationalism. Yep. So when you get the tensions that are emotional, emotionally charged in schools, it's not because of yeah. rational processes. Yes. And there, there has been within um, the part of the school bullying research focus on moral disengagement. So how we disengage ourselves from our um, behavior so, so to justify why we've done it. And there tends to be this idea that, you know, this is a rational process. Whereas often, yeah, it, it would be hard to say that that's a rational process, that you're, a lot of stuff is just happening. So, yeah, I agree. And I think I look forward to reading those <laughs> articles. Anybody else? No? Along those lines, I also think the body. What are the public policies like regarding bullying? Mm -hmm. ¿Y cuáles son los papeles que cumplen no solo los estudiantes, sino que también los profesores y los padres? Uh, ¿Y los padres? Ah, uh, and what are the roles that um, teachers and pets, parents play, not just students, in, in that? Um, there's sort of a little bit of what I talked about, uh, was it yesterday? I'm a bit caught up in which day it is actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, in Sweden, we have two laws uh, that uh, all school staff have to follow, uh, and they have certain responsibilities. So we have a Discrimination Act, which is focused on discrimination and harassment. And then we also have the Education Act, which is focused on degrading treatment. So if you call somebody a name, but it's not connected to these discriminatory grounds, so it's not connected to sexuality or to ethnicity. Or you punch someone just because they're annoying you. Yeah, that would be degrading, but it wouldn't be connected to the uh, 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 homosexual, for example. We have these two different laws, uh, and teachers find it quite difficult because we we took away the term bullying from the laws so that teachers and school staff would deal with every incident, so not just when it's repeated over time. But Anyone who's been in a school, it's really difficult to deal with every incident occur that occurs. But they have a legal responsibility to report every incident of harassment and degrading treatment, uh, which yeah, this is possible. Awesome. Um, so what they're doing is tending to make judgment calls on what is more serious, uh, who's involved, is it the same child, and so on. So essentially, they're drawing on the criteria for bullying, that it's repeated, that there's an intention to hurt the child, that there's this power imbalance so the other kid didn't hit back. Um, and also in terms of parents, parents are raised a lot by teachers as the most problematic part of their job. So, and teachers make, teachers I've talked to anyway, I can't say for the whole of Sweden, but in our study, uh, teachers have, discussed how they are more likely to report an incident involving a child whose parent they know will want that report, wants to know what's happening, will report it to the school inspectorate, and the teacher could get in trouble if they don't report it. Whereas those uh, students whose parents perhaps are perceived as not caring, as not being involved, they tend not to report those as much because they don't have time to report everything. So this is really problematic in terms of those children that perhaps need most help and support and maybe not the ones that are getting it. Um, so yeah, parents and teachers, that's uh, an area that we're looking at a lot at the moment. So we're looking at teachers' perspectives on, rather than just looking at how uh, teachers are bullied by students or how teachers bully students or whatever, we want to know, what can we, what do they need to do the job? Because we have these laws, we've decided that they have to do all these things. 
but it's not really possible. They're stressed, they're burnt out, they're quitting their jobs, they're going on sick leave because they can't handle it. Um, so how do we help them? But so it's a long-winded answer to you. Okay, well, thank you again, Paul, for the presentation. It's a, a little symbolic <laughs> gesture from the department. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, Robert. That's it for venir. Esperamos que sigamos con los colocios.